Welcome to today's session on social risk adjustment and, and equitable health outcomes. We are delighted to have this particular panel and to explain some work that the Health Equity Advisory Team has been doing over the past few months. You remember at the end of 2021, the Health Equity Advisory Team came up with a technical guidance document that covered how alternative payment models could advance health equity. We focused primarily upon care transformation and advice regarding payment. And so there wasn't time to do everything. And perhaps number three on the list of, of factors that we wanted to discuss, but didn't have time initially was social risk adjustment. The idea that adjusting for a, a beneficiary of populations, non-medical factors or, or social factors could play an important role in the overall workings of an alternative payment model to advance health equity. The Health Equity Advisory Team has had about three meetings in this current year to start discussing social risk adjustment, and we're aiming to have a technical guidance report come out later this summer. We have this panel today to update you on where we're at, and then also to dive more deeply into some of the challenging issues. And we're lucky to have a, a great panel of experts to help us with this particular task. I'm gonna share two slides with you. The one, first one is the one here where in some ways, this is like the overall overall overview or overall uh, uh, vision of like how social risk adjustment relates to alternative payment models and equitable outcomes. This is pretty dense, so I'm actually gonna read it verbatim and, and listen carefully and, and, and connect the dots as, as uh, I, I go along with you. When we apply or incorporate social risk adjustment into the payment incentives and structures of APMs, more providers, especially those that provide care to historically underserved groups, are better positioned to participate in APMs because they have greater financial potential and less risk of penalty. These additional resources enable care transformation that ensures quality, accessible, and efficient care for beneficiaries. They can also minimize inequities among beneficiaries when appropriately allocated. Providers participating in APMs receive higher payments upfront in order to improve quality of care and outcomes for individuals with complex health and social needs. They are also rewarded when they improve quality of care and outcomes for individuals with complex health and social needs. A greater number of historically underserved groups realize improved outcomes and reduce disparities as a result of effective APMs. While social risk adjustment advances this outcome, risk adjustment alone cannot achieve health equity. It is important to consider other policy and regulatory mechanisms needed to complement risk adjustment and advance health equity. So the last point is a critical one we'll come back to during the panel that, that risk adjustment we believe is a critical part of the solution, but risk adjustment alone can't solve the problems. And we need to think about the multiple levers at our disposal in conjunction and how they can helpfully, hopefully advance health equity. But also mentioned that uh, social risk adjustment is one of the major current interests of CMS. So it's great that the work of, of the land and the health equity advisory team aligns so well with, with CMS. Next slide. Uh, next slide goes up. Uh, I mentioned that there was a technical guidance report that came out from the heat uh, at the end of 2021. And this was one of the key figures, which is in some ways the, the conceptual model figure for how APMs can lead to more equitable health outcomes on the left. And in some ways, this is a reminder first that it's not social risk adjustment for social risk adjustment's sake, but it's all geared towards how does social risk adjustment fit into leading to that far left outcome, more equitable health outcomes. You see in the middle of the diagram, these major categories, which were in some ways some of the major areas or domains that alternative payment models work in that are crucial then for uh, getting to health equity. So care delivery redesign, payment incentives and structures, and performance measurement. And you see the far right column, the heat had basically divided or had subcategories for each of those three different drivers uh, of, of key aspects at a more granular level. You see in the, uh, the big blue outline, clinical and social risk adjustment to payment. Uh, and so uh, we thought that was a, a critical component. You see that on the far right also, there's a number of these other subcategories that have these round dots 
which we thought had a, a particularly close relationship to, to risk adjustment also. So you see going from top to bottom, the provision of person-centered culturally and linguistically appropriate care. So again, social risk adjustment has to be linked to how does it lead to appropriate care. You see then uh, infrastructure payments for care delivery transformation. So how could social risk adjustment lead to uh, appropriate infrastructure payments uh, according to the organizations with the different patients with different uh, levels of social risk. And then the next, next one here, payment designed to focus on populations historically harmed and underserved in healthcare systems. The next payment incentives to reduce health disparities in quality of care outcomes to patient experience. And below that, you see in some ways some infrastructural issues, the collection of data related to health disparities, including social risk data, and then uh, eventually stratified and risk adjusted performance measures. So it's a complicated sort of terrain here of how social risk adjustment interacts with some of these other key levers that again, ultimately work towards improving equitable health outcomes. So we are really fortunate today that we do have a panel of, of outstanding experts and people, Drs. Mark Freeberg, Brian Powers, Christina Severin, and Matthew Spann. And uh, th these four experts, they, they represent providers, payers, and state governments. And so over this next half hour or so, we're going to learn how these different organizations have thought about social risk adjustment. We'll go into a panel discussion. I'll answer, ask each panelist a sort of a kickoff question, and then we'll hopefully leave time for then uh, you here in the audience to ask questions too. Let me first introduce our, our panelists. Uh, the first is, is, is Mark Freeberg, who is currently the Senior Vice President of Performance Measurement and Improvement at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Massachusetts. A uh, message uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield is, is one of the largest Blue Cross Blue Shields uh, in, in the country. And it's, it is the largest health plan in, in Massachusetts. And Mark is responsible for all the activities related to measuring and improving performance of the provider network, including quality and equity. He's uh, also been involved in value-based contracts, the alternative quality contract. Uh, Mark is a general internist and he provides care at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Uh, I've known Mark since he was a, a, a trainee and, and a general terms medicine fellow. And it's so new early on, this is an incredibly bright, thoughtful person uh, with um, just great judgment. And it's just so um, great that he is in such an impactful, uh, powerful position now, a, a person of Mark's quality. Um, Dr. Brian Powers, he's a deputy chief medical officer at Humana, and he supports rapid learning and evaluation of Humana's integrated care delivery strategy and leads research and payment and delivery innovation and drives physician engagement, alignment, advocacy, and education across the company. Um, Brian had a terrific piece recently in health affairs and uh, was a, one of the panelists on a great health affairs webinar on this particular topic. So he brings a lot of great experience and current expertise and knowledge to this area. Uh, Christina Severin is the president and CEO of Community Care Cooperative um, CCO is a Massachusetts Health Accountable Care Organization created by federally qualified health centers to better serve their communities. Um, Christina is an accomplished healthcare executive with more than 20 years of experience in managed care, delivery systems, health insurance, ACOs, quality, public policy, and public health. Christina is a member of the HEAT. Um, I've been on a couple of different committees with her, and she consistently is one of those people that, that um, gives important like, comments and feedback that advance the discussion. And uh, it's really clear that she, she grounds her work both in frontline experience uh, with wise judgment. Uh, so it's great to have Christina on the panel today also. And finally, uh, Matthew Spann, who's a manager of Cure Liberty Reform, Minnesota Department of Human Services. And he's worked with the state of Minnesota the past now 14 years in promoting and developing health policy and payment reform initiatives. And since 2013, one of his primary roles is as the lead of Minnesota's Medicaid ACL demonstration known as the Integrated Health Partnership uh, Program, and that he's been heavily involved in the development of VVP in Medicaid. And uh, so Matt, uh, it's great that he, Minnesota is, is one of the states, as you know, that has been doing some of the most innovative cutting edge work in their state Medicaid program regarding equity work. And so uh, terrific to have Matt on this panel also. And so let's just jump straight in. And the first question is for you, Christina, just to sort of ground us all, this is a really complicated topic. And so if you could explain in layman's terms what we mean by social risk adjustment. Absolutely. Um, thanks for the intro. Thank you, colleagues, for joining me today. It's great to be always great to be part of the LAN. And uh, right back at you, Marshall. It's been wonderful working with you and getting to know you. You are 
definitely pulling the industry forward with your skills and your leadership. And I am greatly appreciative and have learned a tremendous amount from you. Um, so in response to your question, as I'm sure many folks in the audience know, about 80% of what drives ill health does not have its origins in clinical pathology. Rather, the ill health is driven by life circumstances that people find themselves in. This might be related to one's race, gender identity, income level, or the intersectionality of any of these characteristics and other characteristics as well. Traditional risk adjustment methods have not taken these factors, these social factors into consideration. Therefore, social risk adjustment is the use of a risk adjustment methodology that recognizes the needed care associated with these characteristics and therefore the cost adjustment that is needed to account for these characteristics. Yeah, thank you so much, Christina. And uh, this next question is for Christina and for Matt. How is your organization using social risk adjustment to improve health equity? Let me start with you, Matt. Sure, thank you, Dr. Shannon. And I, I again want to thank everybody Thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I'm trying my hardest not to be intimidated because I think you guys are uh, incredibly thoughtful and very smart people on this panel. And then also me. So uh, here in Minnesota, um, as I think most of you are probably familiar, we do have what we call the Integrated Health Partnership as Dr. Chin mentioned. And we began building the social risk adjustment into the Integrated Health Partnership program in 2018. That program started originally, our first performance period was 2013, and it was really a pretty basic ACO model. If you can say a, a basic ACO model, and, and I think we're getting to that point to be able to say that these days, um, but we realized after a handful of years and a couple of cycles with contracts with different providers is that we're missing a couple of opportunities. We're missing uh, the ability to really get some of the smaller organizations to join the, pro the program and needed to have, find ways to support them more upfront. So we started to think through what could we do it, it, to bring some of that sort of presumed shared savings into place sooner for these organizations that wanted to kind of transform how they were delivering care. So that was kind of the beginning of a concept that we could build on. So we developed population-based payments, uh, fairly modest, we're talking $5 per member per month on average, um, but that that itself could be based on the clinical risk adjustment using John Hopkins ACG risk grouper and what we ended up doing as a homegrown social risk adjuster that would kind of modify or increase to really reflect some of the groups we worked with that had a, a wider population that sort of were, were dealing with more and more social determinants of health, more and more social risk factors that just created greater intensity of that care coordination. Uh, activity. So that was sort of the main way that we integrated that social risk adjuster. Um, but one of the main things that I think is important to kind of highlight is it doesn't sort of end there. We didn't just say, we'll modify the payment, everything's good, let's move on with our lives. But we saw that that it really created another lever for us, that population-based payments, that increasing based on social risk adjustments. Uh, and honestly, the data that we had to collect to be able to even do that, we said, aha, so we require within the integrated health partnership program kind of in in um, connected to that pvp the requirement for our specific health equity interventions the, the ihps the providers had to had to look at their target their, their population identify various target groups they could be fairly narrow they could be very broad work with us in understanding what their community looked like and identify specific interventions that they would then be in contract with us to uh, pursue, to try to um, improve the lives of our beneficiaries in a really proactive way that was well beyond just in the medical sort of clinical walls. Um, and then how we sort of evaluate that became a whole nother sort of bucket of things that we had to figure out, but it's been a lot of fun. Um, but also because we had all that data, we could then kind of come back and help support that through enhanced data enhanced facilitation of information, understanding their population in a slightly better way. So that SRA is like a component of what became a much bigger 
it was part of the roots, but it's a much bigger plant now, if you will. Yeah, I'm glad you, you raised that, Matt. And it's a heads up to our panelists that maybe after Mark's question, which is actually a nice setup for, for this, um, we're gonna maybe get back to all of you in terms of the point you just made, Matt, of like, how does social risk adjustment fit within the overall puzzle? Because as, as Christina said, it's, it's uh, important and it has a definition, um, but it's just one lever uh, and you start listing some others. So we'll, we'll, we'll have a panel circle back to that in a moment. Um, so Christina, uh, how would you answer the, the question in terms of uh, your organization? Yeah, I mean, so we're an organization that is, we're a 501c3. Our corporate members are federally qualified health centers, FQHCs. They compose the board. They are also the participating providers. So the program that we participate in is the Massachusetts Medicaid or Mass Health ACO program. And it is a program of robust two-sided sort of up-down shared losses, shared, shared savings program. And so when we tell people that we've got um, 19 health centers in this organization this year participating in financial risk, pretty much 100% up down with some risk corridors, they are often quite surprised that there are health centers who are in a position and have been since this 1115 waiver, which is the Mass Health ACO started in 2018. They're surprised that health centers are participating in so much total cost of care risk. One of the many factors that Mass Medicaid, under the leadership of Dan Sai at the time, put in place was the social driver of health risk adjuster. And that became one of many things that created a financial environment that set, that that felt safe and sound for health centers sort of step on in and begin to take risk. We don't expose health centers to 100% of risk on day one, although they do all take meaningful risk on day one. As we've seen things play out since 2018, the social risk adjuster that Massachusetts uses, which we don't have time to get into today, but I, I'm sure that I speak for Marshall and everybody else on the land heat that they're sick of hearing me talk about the Massachusetts SDO, Mass Medicaid SDOH risk adjuster, because it's really uh, quite brilliant, created a financial environment where benchmarks are appropriately adjusted based on risk that cannot necessarily be captured in ICD-10 codes that do reflect the complexity and the needs of the population served. Great, great. And, and Brian, so how is Humana using social risk adjustment? Yeah, and, um, so I, I think, you know, it's interesting to contrast uh, what Christina was just speaking about. And I, I want to spend a little bit of time that we have today talking about some of our early efforts to understand kind of how social risk adjustment might play out specifically in the Medicare program. So unlike mass Medicaid, you know, don't really have an approach for social risk adjustment in the Medicare Advantage program um, as it stands now, I'd say, we're doing a lot of work to understand you know, the different ways in which you could do social risk adjustment and the, the implications of that for our ultimate end goal of improved health equity. And, and for us at Humana, our approach to social, social risk adjustment is really rooted in our longstanding focus on addressing the health related social needs of our members. And in that work, which has been largely focused on benefit design and community partnerships and interventions, we actually collected a good deal of self-reported health related social needs data from our members. And that's the data that we're using um, and to better understand kind of what are the different approaches in social risk adjustment um, and, and trying to understand, you know, what um, with the available data out there, how can we do this in the best possible way? Um, I think only with the deep understanding of the, you know, discrete relationship between social risk factors and spending for a Medicare population, are we going to be able to design effective and efficient approaches to social risk adjustment? I'd say if we've learned anything about value-based payment and equity more broadly, it's that we have to be super intentional about that design up front and also really mindful of unintended consequences. And so one thing to speak about and that we're spending a lot of time thinking about is the data that you use for social risk adjustment. I won't go into too much detail, um, but I think there's sort of two big buckets you can think about is do we use individual level data? So data on a specific individual social risk, either administrative data, like whether they're duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, or maybe they're self-reported um, health related social needs. You know, are they having difficulty getting to the doctor's office because of transportation? Or do we use community level data? Um, 
many uh, folks in the audience are probably familiar with indices like the Area Deprivation Index or the Social Vulnerability Index. Usually these area level indices drawn from census data that reflect kind of at a community level structural uh, disadvantage and, and access barriers. And it turns out from what we've seen in our work is that the, the choice you make really has a profound impact on the end result of social risk adjustment. And I think quite interestingly, you know, what we're seeing in our data is, is not necessarily what's happening uh, or what was borne out in the mass Medicaid example, which I think shows the context specific nature of social risk adjustment and how the approach maybe in one state or one payer group um, may not you know, be carried over to others. And so just quickly to sort of talk about what we've seen in our data is that you know, the community level estimates uh, of social risk are, are attractive, um, but we found that they're really only weakly correlated with individual, individual level social needs. There's actually some research coming out of UCSF that found that if you use these high disadvantaged neighborhoods, you only capture about half of the individuals who report a health related social need. And so we, you know, there's a worry there that if you were to, you know, use that as the way to identify folks who have need or use that for social risk adjustment, you'd really be missing a lot of folks um, who have need. And I think a more kind of nefarious and potentially unintended consequence of using these community level indices is that at the end of the day, they're, they're proxies for, they're kind of weak proxies for individual social need, but strong proxies for structural disadvantage and structural barriers for access. And that can do funny things in a risk adjustment model when you start incorporating it. And so what we've seen um, is that when you sort of add a social, a community level social variable to a risk adjustment model on top of the demographic and clinical variables that are usually in there already, you actually see that those, those measures of, of area level social risk, like the ADI, are actually correlated with lower spending. Um, and the concern there is that if you were then just to add it into the risk adjustment model, you'd be setting your benchmarks lower for those, um, those areas and potentially sort of funneling lower amounts of payments. There's clearly ways around that. I bring that up more as a way just to say that we have to be mindful of the unintended consequences there. Um, you know, briefly, we see the opposite happening when we look at the individual level data that we have. So for our members that we have, their self-reported health-related social needs, food insecurity, financial insecurity, unreliable transportation, we see the opposite. We see a very strong positive correlation with, with spending, conditional on, again, those, those variables that are usually in a risk adjustment model like um, comorbidities and demographics. And, you know, one, one stat just to share is that if we look at our members with two or more self-reported health-related social needs, compared to those with none, uh, and, and, and again, conditional on demographic and clinical risk, their spending is about 18% higher. And so and that, that is the fact of why we're having this discussion is that the sort of current approaches don't necessarily account for that risk. And so we're, you know, we're optimistic that we can find an approach that, that will allow us to better calibrate you know, payments and benchmarks for social risk, but also really cognizant of the need to do a lot of upfront work to understand what data inputs we should be drawing on and how exactly we should set up the models. And then also be really mindful as things start um, being implemented and tested that we're kind of monitoring continuously for any um, any unintended consequences. Yeah, I really like Brian, how you make the point that it's not magic of like throwing in a social risk adjustment. You got to connect the dots of like, well, what, why should that have the effect you want it to have? How can you avoid unintended negative consequences? Your example of like a community level measure of social risk being correlated with lower spending or utilization, perhaps because of access barriers, um, is an important one of like how then if you're going to use that to risk adjust payment, you know, you could have the, the, the unintended negative effect. Um, so, uh, Mark, you have the last of foundational questions. Um, in some ways, it's, it's the question is like the other piece of the puzzle of like putting aside social risk adjustment for a moment. What are some of the other levers and tools you use at Blue Cross Blue Shield to advance health equity? So that's the other financial question. Um, you can tie that together with being the first of like um, the integrative answers that others will supply also. And like, um, given that, um, how does social risk adjustment fit with these other things? In other words, what are social risk adjustment good for? What is it not good for? How does it then fit with these other things that you're gonna be talking about? So maybe first, like what are these other levers and mechanisms you have? Sure, thanks, Marshall. Um, so yeah, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts to improve the equity of care that our members receive, starting on the basis of racial and ethnic equity of care. And I would say social risk adjustment has to do with the component of inequities that we see across our market that goes between providers. If we have under-resourced providers that serve disproportionate share of racial and ethnic minoritized communities, that will contribute to between provider inequities in care that we see at the market level and that we don't want to see. We want to see those reduced. But there's also a within provider uh, component of inequities. And there we are starting to stand up um, 
a full incorporation of equity within our alternative quality contract, which is an ACO type contract that we've had for almost 15 years now. Um, it's a category three uh, payment model in the HCP lands uh, rubric. And the way we're incorporating it is fully. So there's three main components of the alternative quality contract. There's data. We've long given providers um, highly accurate, timely data on their performance throughout the life of a contract. Now we're incorporating for the first time equity reports um, that show each provider how they're doing on measures of equity and how they're doing in a blinded fashion as compared to other uh, uh, providers within our market. That's information that you know, really, I would say a payer is uniquely uh, positioned to uh, provide to providers, even if they are tracking it internally, they may have lacked those benchmarks previously. So we gave all of our AQC providers those uh, data points um, beginning last fall, and it's moving into full production beginning uh, January 1st of next year. Um, we also uh, have a second pillar, which is our support pillar for AQC groups. Um, this is, uh, has two main components. We've long had technical assistance that we have uh, an in-house staff for to help our provider network uh, improve on quality measures. Now they're focusing, uh, widening the focus, I would say, to explicitly improving on equity measures as well. And because we didn't have a lot of track record in-house on coaching providers on improving the equity of care, we partnered with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or IHI, out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, to go ahead and, and supplement uh, our technical assistance efforts. And we are convening an equity action community uh, that kicked off last fall. Um, and all the AQC groups are participating in that as well. Uh, we're, we're shouldering the full cost uh, of that EQC participation. Along with that, uh, we have made a $25 million grant to the IHI, which is now being distributed to the participants in the equity action community this year and next. Um, this is intended to support equity improving capabilities uh, within each of the AQC groups, and also to, um, I would say, kind of approximate like what uh, social risk adjustment might aim to achieve, which is to both help groups on uh, fundamental infrastructure uh, capabilities, like just having uh, internal data on race and ethnicity and other uh, social risk factors of their patients, as well as um, to uh, help those groups that um, uh, may have a resource disadvantage uh, stand up and, and uh, bolster their internal QI uh, apparatus. The third component, and this is the one that usually gets the most attention, but I, I think it's, it's really not necessarily the most important component, is incorporating equity measures explicitly into our pay for performance program. Uh, this, this means that uh, uh, for the first time ever, um, we will not be sort of relying on what I would say is a, a good spillover effect of pay for performance to hopefully improve the equity of care for our members, but to now say, look, if you improve in an equitable fashion, you'll be paid more than if you improve in a way that, that doesn't touch equity or that even could potentially worsen the equity of care that our members receive. That's intended to help um, organizations make a, you know, a, a long-standing business case to make investments in equity of care that otherwise uh, wouldn't have a direct economic uh, benefit to them. I'll just close by saying uh, the reason we're approaching it in this way is that social risk adjustment, I think, makes a lot of sense for a government payer that has tremendous uh, market power. So Medicare and you know, Medicaid uh, can, can almost unilaterally um, in, a, in a way that commercial insurers cannot, even a relatively large communal, uh, com commercial insurer, uh, cannot actually uh, use an equation to set budget targets. Um, a lot of the, the budget targets is actually determined through negotiation, which has a lot to do with the market power of various providers. And sometimes, um, uh, and I think this is probably the norm, not the exception, markets have consolidated in such a way that market power concentrates in a way that worsens uh, uh, equity and care. And so we have to counteract that. Great, thank you so much, Mark. So um, we have about seven more minutes. And so um, I'd like to try to cover two more questions. We're, we're getting from the audience that many, many people are asking um, the question about what instruments are you using for social risk adjustment? So maybe you guys could answer that as well as how you would sort of help someone think this through of like, how should one be thinking about what things to think about in terms of pros and cons of an instrument or what factors are important. And then we'll hopefully we'll have time to end with the question about how does it all fit together? Like where does social risk adjustment fit regarding these other levers too? So um, what social risk adjustment tool are you using and how should people be thinking about this? Uh, in any order. I, I can I'm jump happy on. To talk a oh. <laughs> Matt, you go, you, you go first and I will go after you. 
it was inevitable it was going to happen at some point. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll try to be really quick. In Minnesota, we use what's really a more homegrown tool. It uh, utilizes individual level information that we can gather either through our data warehouse, uh, our enrollment system, through other programs that are served by the Department of Human Services, or that we can get from other agencies like the Department of Corrections, uh, et cetera. And so we, we really build it on top of our existing uh, individual level clinical group, uh, uh, risk grouper, you know, in that sense. Uh, we have tons more information on our website, so I won't go into details around that, so we have time for the other questions. But as far as sort of how you would approach this, I mean, what data do you have? What information do you have? What are you trying to accomplish with that social risk adjuster? For us, individual level made sense because of how we were trying to approach it. A, in more more of a sense than sort of a community wide or geographic based, um, but I think that's sort of got to be it's got to be starting with what are my what are we really trying to do here and what do we have available and it's not going to be perfect. Yes, ma'am. Massachusetts Medicaid also has a homegrown uh, social driver of health risk adjuster. And it has sort of two core pillars. One is information that is picked up off of certain, mostly ICD-10s, for example, Z59.0, which is an experience of homelessness. So if you code for that Z code, you will get credit on the SDOH adjuster. Also, if MassHealth receives three claims for a patient with different addresses. So three different addresses in a rolling 12 month period, you will ring the bell on a patient having demonstrated an experience of homelessness and get the SDOH adjuster on that. There are also certain combinations of codes that can be received or how you can demonstrate an experience of homelessness if combined with a significant behavioral health condition will also gain you more risk adjustment points on the SDOH adjuster. In addition to those characteristics, the state has developed something called the neighborhood stress score. The neighborhood stress score, stress score is a buildup of, I believe, seven criteria that the state is able to collect through Massachusetts and or national sources for example, locally information they can get from the Department of Mental Health with, for individuals with a serious behavioral health condition. And national examples would be census track information on a neighborhood with a certain percent of people experiencing unemployment or at a certain level of the federal, below the federal poverty limit. And so it combines those two things together into the aggregated SDOH risk algorithm. Thanks, Christina. Add in a, a couple of thoughts there. Um, I think, you know, in terms of what we've looked at, so we, you know, we participate in the, or we'll be participating in the ACR REACH program from CMMI, which I think brings in, as, as you all know, sort of the ADI, so a community level index with the ADI and then also dual status importantly in a way that doesn't introduce the unintended consequences that I mentioned earlier. So it adjusts the benchmark up for being in a high ADI. It doesn't really add it in as a predictor model. And so that's one approach of getting around some of the sort of squirrely things that can happen when you start having proxies for poor access be your social risk adjusters. Um, you know, what we're looking at more internally with that self-reported data is um, responses to the uh, CMS Accountable Health Communities uh, screening instrument. So we've uh, another program and project coming out of CMMI, we've sort of adapted that screening instrument and survey our members for their health self-reported health-related social needs and sort of use either just as, as binary indicators, you know, are you housing insecure or not? Do you have unreliable transportation or not? Or almost like a count of the total burden of health-related social needs using um, using that survey. So I think those are those are two approaches. I just wanna emphasize what, what Matt said. I, I think a challenge here in terms of how to approach this is, is really clarifying around the goal that you're trying to achieve, because the way in which you do social risk adjustment, you know, oftentimes those goals can be mutually exclusive. And so is the goal to have a better calibrated risk adjustment model? Is it to have higher payments to certain groups? Is it to have more equitable payments across groups? Um, I think only if we, um, in the specific context, define that upfront, then it becomes somewhat of an empirical question to answer. And you can try different approaches and test different models and see what works. 
I think we can run into problems when we are each speaking with two or different goals. And then one of us might think that the risk of adjustment model is working well, but then someone else who is intended, you know, a different end goal, um, you know, it ends up in a different spot. Mark, do you have a 15 second uh, word of wisdom regarding the tool you're using? Sure. Um, so I would say you can start before you have a tool in the field by using uh, community level data. And there are a number of different um, algorithms out there that are based on uh, census data, for example. I think those are fine to start with while you collect data. You don't have to wait for perfect data to move forward. Actually, a question for the organizers that so um, we're about at the time of the official end time of the original, but we started late. So how many more minutes do we have? I'll start riffing a little bit while, while we get the answer. Um, the question about like where social risk adjustment fits in with the other levers, um, I'd have you think back to that that slide I showed of like the overall logic model that again, and I think Brian was making this point that you gotta be intentional about this, that like that uh, the goal here is equitable health outcomes. And it's, again, it's not magic. Uh, what leads to equitable health outcomes is when the care is transformed so that it meets the needs of, 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 the, of, of our patients, their specific needs. That doesn't happen by magic also, that uh, there's gotta be the money flow to enable that type of care transformation to occur. So I think at a, at a simple level, those are some of the basic pieces that need to occur. So you hear social risk adjustment, it's just not in isolation, but it's related to all of the above. Uh, so, so that's, I think, maybe some of the challenge that the heat and all of us of like, how do we get it to work in terms of like the, the, the puzzle to fit together? Because social risk adjustment, I think there's just like um, there were a lot of questions from the audience about these tools. Similarly, when you have any talk about social risk adjustment, I think a lot of healthcare delivery organizations say that it's got to be part of the solution. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be penalized for caring for uh, harder, uh, more socially challenged patients. At the same time, um, you can easily see how um, a poorly designed system, as, as Brian was discussing, could lead to like either the negative effects or wouldn't connect the dots in terms of payment going to where it should be going to support those patients and providers, those care systems to lead to the equitable health outcomes. Um, have not heard an answer yet. So I think we're actually probably about the time that we need to stop because we're now like a, a couple minutes over. But thank you so much for our, our, our great panelists. So we had uh, Mark Freeberg, Christina Severin, Brian Powers, Matt Spann. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing your time, your wisdom, um, your judgment. Uh, it's, it's a tough issue. Um, we're going to be spending more time on this, uh, the heat in the land. Thank you to the heat and, and everyone's input to the work that we're doing to get self equity. Thank you very much.